Excuse me. My guys, it is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous, over the top, beautiful Mother's Day. Mother's Day. Uh, that would make it Sunday, May 10th, 2020, I believe. It's May 10th or is it May 9th? Somewhere, May 9th or 10th, 2020. So anyway, uh, being, yes, May 10th, of course, being May 10th, 2020, we all know what that means. It's the second to the last day of uh, my public personas here on uh, YouTube. For those of you who do not know, I have two personas here on YouTube. <clears throat> and uh, so what I love about Sundays is that I get to wear both hats. And so for the very last time, uh, I will be bringing you uh, my Sunday sermon on the public edition of that one channel. And I guess this will be my closing chronicle of the collapse for Collapse Chronicles until further notice. And so I was looking for a good... Uh, Mother's Day, a good Mother Earth uh, sermon. And my dear sweet sister has sent me this Pulitzer Prize winning book by novelist Richard Powers called The Overstory. And The Overstory, what it is, it's actually a, a volume of short stories. And the uh, common theme among all these short stories is that they feature trees. That trees are a major care, play a big a part of character as the humans. So what he does is he just goes through a wide uh, variety of, uh, of, of, of adventures or whatnot and he picks somebody's name. In this case, uh, this person's name, the main character of this study is Doug, Douglas Pavlicek. Douglas Pavlicek, who is a Vietnam vet who has returned home and uh, trying to decide what to do with the rest of his life. He's just, you know, kind of bumbling through life uh, after coming back from Vietnam. And so we're going to read the closing scene from, uh, from his chapter. So, guys, what I get to do here, you know, I'm 60 years old. Did you know you guys could do this with these Dollar Tree glasses? What you can do when you reach the biggest number, which is 325, and you still can't read the print, what you can do is you can put another pair of glasses on top of them. So what I'm doing is I'm taking these twos and I'm adding them to the 3.25s to give me 5.25 so the old man can actually read you the overstory by Richard Powers. <clears throat> Life counts down Nine years, six jobs, two aborted love affairs, three state license plates, two and a half tons of adequate beer, and one recurring nightmare. With another full ending, with, I'm sorry, with an, even with two pairs of glasses, with another fall ending and winter coming on, Douglas Pavlicek fetches the ball peen hammer and smashes a row of potholes into the somewhat surfaced road that runs past the horse ranch and down toward Blackfoot. I think this is Idaho is where he's living. The goal is to slow people down so he can stand by the fence and see their faces a little. Come November, it may be some time before he'll have that pleasure again. I know what it means, Douglas, not to have the pleasure of seeing people's faces. Anyway, Douglas makes a Saturday of it after the horses have been fed and read to. The scheme works. If the car slows down enough, he and the dog jog alongside until the driver either opens the window to say hello or pulls a gun. 
a couple of nice conversations that way, real give and take. One guy even stops for a minute. Doug is aware that the, the behavior could appear somewhat eccentric from the outside, but it is Idaho, and when you spend all your hours with horses, your soul expands a bit until the ways of men reveal themselves to be no more than a costume party. Hmm. You'd be well advised not to take at face value. I love the unintentional irony for the spring of 2020. In fact, it's Dougie's growing conviction that the greatest flaw of our species is its overwhelming tendency to mistake agreement for truth. Hmm. Single biggest influence on what a body will or will not believe is what nearby bodies broadcast over the public band. Get three people in a room and they will decide that the law of gravity is evil and should be rescinded because one of their uncles got shit-faced and fell off the roof. He has tried this idea out on others without much success, but a bit of steel floating around near his lumber four vertebra, a small war chest of kiss-off pension, an Air Force cross, pawned, a belated purple heart, the back of which reminds him of a toilet seat, and the ability to make things with his hands, all entitle him to strong opinions. He still limps a bit. This is where he had, uh, had a, he was parachuting out of a plane in Vietnam and landed in a banyan tree, which both saved his life and about killed him at the same time. He still limps a bit as he swings the hammer. His face has grown long and horsey in unconscious in imitation of the animals he tends. He lives by himself for seven months out of the year while the ranch's elderly owners make the circuit of their other hobbies and houses. Mountains him in him, him in on three sides. The only TV reception he can get is the ant races. And still a part of him wants to know if his few and private thoughts might in fact be ratified by someone somewhere. The confirmation of others, a sickness, the entire race will die of. And still he spends the second Saturday of October working the road in front of the house hoping a good sized pothole will slow folks down. He's about to bag the checkpoint for the day and head back to the barn to talk Nietzsche with Chief Plenty Coup, the Belgian draft horse, when a red Dodge Dart crest arrives at somewhere near the speed of sound Seeing the stretch of craters, the car slams into an admirably controlled skid. Doug and the dog start their lope. The window is down by the time they come up alongside. A substantially red-headed woman leans out. They have much to talk about, Doug sees, destined to become friends. She says, why is the road so messed up? just here. Insurgents, Doug explains. <laughs> she rolls up her window and speeds off. <coughs> Axles be damned. Not even a look. Game over. It takes something out of Douglas. Yet another last straw. Not even enough Elan Vital left over to read the next bit of Zarahustra to the horse. That night, the temperature drops into the teens with sandpapery snowflakes scouring his face like the whole great outdoors turned into a California exfoliation parlor. He heads to Blackfoot, where he lays in a month's worth of fruit, fruit, crop, fruit cocktail in case the drifts come early. 
he ends up at the billiards bar dispensing silver dollars like they're aluminum extrusion slugs. You must be ready to burn yourself in your own flame, he tells a fair chunk of the clientele. The speaker thus speaks former prisoner 571, who will forever have to say that he did not give his blanket to a fellow inmate when he should have. He comes home after 18 rounds of eight balls with more money than he left with, buries the cash in the north pasture alongside the rest of the nest egg before the ground gets cool, too cold to dig. Winter here is longer than civilization's running tab. I love that one. Winter here is longer than civilization's running tab. He whistles, he builds things out of his pile of antlers. A lamp, a coat rack, a chair. He thinks about that redhead and her glorious unattainable kind. He listens to the animals doing calisthenics in the attic. He makes it through the portable Nietzsche and, and continues with the complete Nostradamus, burning it page by page in the wood stove as he finishes each one. He grooms the hell out of the horses, rides them daily by rotation in the indoor ring, and reads them Paradise Lost since Nostradamus is too upsetting. In the spring, he takes his 22 out into the brush, but he can't pull the trigger or, or even, he can't pull the trigger even on a lame hair. There's something wrong with him, he is aware. When his employers return in early summer, he thanks them and quits. He's not sure where he's going. Since his last flight as a loadmaster, such knowledge has been an impossible luxury. <clears throat> he wants to keep heading west. Trouble is, the only strip still west of him feels like going east again. And yet he's got his used but solid F-100, new tires, a fair amount of coin, his veteran's disability, and a friend in Eugene, Oregon. Beautiful back roads lead him through the mountains all the way to Boise and beyond. Life is as good as it has been since he fell out of the sky and into the banyan tree. The truck radio drifts in and out through the canyons like the songs are coming from the moon, high lonesome blending into techno. He's not listening anyway. He's tracing, he's trancing out on the miles long walls of Engelman spruce and subalpine fir. He pulls off onto the shoulder to relieve himself. Out here on these ridges, he could pee on the highway center line and humanity would be none the wiser. But savagery is a slippery slope, as he is often read to the horses. He steps off the road and into the woods. And there, flag at half-mast, eyes toward the wilderness, waiting for his bladder to lift the lock down. <laughs> waiting for his bladder to lift the lock down. Yes, Douglas Pavlicek sees the slabs of light through the trunks where there should be shadow all the way to the forest heart. He zips and investigates, walks deeper into the undergrowth, only deeper in turns to be farther out, the shortest of hikes, and he pops out again into, you can't even call it a clearing, call it the moon. A stumpy desolation spreads in front of him, the ground bleeds reddish slag mixed with sawdust and slash. Every direction for as far as he can see resembles a gigantic plucked fowl. It's like the alien death rays have hit and the world is asking permission to end. Only one thing in his experience comes even close 
the patches of jungle that he, Dow, and Monsanto helped to clear. But this clearing is much more efficient. He stumbles back through the curtain of concealing trees, crosses the road, and peers through the woods on the other side. More moonscape stretches down the mountainside. He starts up the truck and drives. The route looks like forest, mile after emerald mile, but Dougie sees through the illusion now. He is driving through the thinnest artery of pretend life, a scrim hiding a bomb crater as big as a sovereign state. The forest is pure prop, a piece of clever artistry. The trees are like a few dozen movie extras hired to fill a tight shot and pretend to be New York. He stops at a gas station to tank up. He asks the cashier, have they been clear cutting up the valley? The man takes Doug's silver dollars. Shit, yeah. And hiding it behind a little voter's curtain, they're called beauty strips, vista corridors. But isn't this all national forest? The cashier just stares like maybe there's some trick to the question's sheer stupidity. Doug says, I thought National Forest was protected land. The cashier blows a raspberry as big as a pineapple. You're thinking National Parks. National Forest job is to get the cut out cheap to whoever is buying. Well, education, run amok, Douglas makes it a practice to learn something new every day. This little datum will last him for some days to come. Anger starts to boil over somewhere before Bend, I mean Bend, Oregon. It's not just the hundreds of thousands of acres that have vanished on him from one morning to its adjacent afternoon. He can accommodate the fact that Smokey the Bear and Ranger Rick are socking away pensions paid by Weyerhaeuser. But the deliberate, simple-minded, and sickeningly effective trick of that highway lining curtain of trees makes him want to smack someone. Every mile of it dupes his heart, just like they planned. It all looks so real, so virgin, so unspoiled. He feels like he's on the Cedar Mountain from that Gilgamesh, which he found back in the ranch library and read to the horses last year. The forest from the first day of creation. But it turns out Gilgamesh and his punk friend Enkidu have already been through and trashed the place. Oldest story in the world, you could drive across the state and never know. That is the fury of the thing. And Eugene Douglas converts a hefty tower of silver dollars into a ride in a small prop plane. <clears throat> Just take me in the biggest circle you can make for the money, and I want to see what down here looks like from up there. It looks like the shaved flank of a sick beast being readied for surgery everywhere, in all directions. If the view were televised, cutting would stop tomorrow. Back on the planet's concealing surface, Douglas spends three days on his buddy's couch, mute. He has no capital, no political savvy, no golden tongue, no economic sophistication or social wherewithal. All he has is a clear cut in front of him, whether his eyes are open or closed, haunting him all the way to the horizon. He makes some inquiries. 
Then he hires out his one and a half good legs to a contractor planting seedlings back into the stripped lands. They kid him out with a shovel and a Johnny Appleseed bag filled with seedlings for which they charge him a few pennies each. And for each planted tree that is still alive in a month, they promise to pay him 20 cents. Douglas fir, America's most valuable timber tree. So sure, why not grow a tree farm full of nothing but Douglas fir? Five new houses per acre. He knows he is slinging trees for middlemen to the same fuckers who cut down the primordial gods to begin with. Just let the uh, hot rod go by. Where was I? Five new houses per acre. He knows he is slinging trees for middlemen to the same fuckers who cut down the primordial gods to begin with, but he doesn't have to vanquish the lumber industry or even get nature's revenge. He just needs to earn a living and undo the look of those cuts, a look that tunnels into him like a beetle into sapwood. He spends his days traversing the silent, slop filled sloping dead zones. He drags himself across the scattered crap on all fours, losing his footing in the impenetrable slash, hauling himself forward by his claws over the chaos of roots, sticks, branches, limbs, stumps and trunks, fibrous and shredded, left to rot in a tangled graveyard. He masters the art of a hundred different ways to topple. He stoops, makes a little wedge in the ground, stuffs in a seedling, and closes the hole with a loving mud nuzzle from his boot tip. Then he does that again and again in starburst and scattered nets, up hillsides and down denuded gullies, dozens of times an hour, hundreds of times a day, thousands by thousands every week until his whole throbbing 34-year-old body puffs out like it's filled with viper venom. Some days he would saw off his gimpy leg with a file if he only had one handy. He sleeps in tree planter camps filled with hippies and illegals, tough, lovable people too tired at day's end to bother much with talk. A saying comes to him as he lies down at night, stiffened with pain, words he once read to his charges in his prior life as a ranch hand. If you are holding a sapling in your hand when the Messiah arrives, first plant the sapling and then go out and greet the Messiah. Neither he nor the horses could make much of that until now. The smell of the cuts overwhelms him, damp spice drawer, dank wool, rusty nails, pickled peppers. Scents that return him to his childhood, aromas that inject him with inexplicable happiness, smells that plunge him down to the bottom of the deepest well and hold him there for hours. Then there's the sound, like his ears are wadded up with pillow, the snarl of saws and feller bunchers somewhere in the distance. A great truth comes over him. Trees fall with spectacular crashes, but planting is silent and growth is invisible. Some days dawn breaks in Arthurian mists. There are mornings when the chill threatens to kill him, noons when the heat knocks him on his semi-numbed butt, afternoons so profligate with blue he lies on his back and stares upward till his eyes water. There come 
mocking and merciless rains, rain the weight and color of lead, shy rain auditioning with stage fright, rain that leaves his feet sprouting moss and lichens. There were huge spiked skeins of interwoven woods here once. They will come again. Sometimes he works alongside other tree slingers, some of whom speak no language he recognizes. He meets hikers who want to know where the forest of their youth have gone. The seasonal pineros come and go, and the hard corers like him keep on. Mostly it's him and the brute, blank, stripped down rhythm of the work wedge, squat, insert, stand, and boot tip seal. They look so pitiful, his tiny Douglas firs, like pipe cleaners, like props for a train set. From a distance spread across these man-made meadows, they're a crew cut on a balding man, but each weedy stem he puts into the dirt is a magic trick eons in the making. He rolls them out by the thousands, and he loves and trusts them as he would dearly love to trust his fellow man. Left alone, and there is the catch, left alone to the air and the light and rain, each one might put on tens of thousands of pounds. Any one of his starts could grow for the next 600 years and dwarf the largest factory chimney. It could play host to generations of voles that never go to ground and several dozen species of insects whose only desire is to strip their host bare. Could, could rain down 10 million needles a year on its own lower branches building up mats of soil that grow their own gardens high into the air. Any one of these gangly seedlings could push out millions of cones over the course of its life. The small yellow males with their pollen that floats across entire states, the drooping females with their mouse tails sticking out from the coil of scales, a look he finds dearer than his own life, and the forest they might remake, he can almost smell resinous, fresh, thick with yearning, sap of a fruit that is no fruit, the scent of Christmas is endlessly older than Christ. Douglas Pavlicek works a clear cut as big as downtown Eugene saying, goodbye to his plants he, as he tucks each one in. Hang on, only 10 or 20 decades, child's play for you guys. You just, you just have to outlast us. Then no one will be left to fuck you over. <laughs> Amen, brother, uh, brother Richard Powers in the overstory. So, uh, as I say, uh, with each chapter, he picks a different uh, species of tree. And uh, I have not gotten to the cottonwood tree yet. I have gotten already to... Uh, I guess it was a chestnut tree that was hit by lightning. You know, he, he talks about the, uh, the chestnut tree blight. Of course, he talks about the American elm blight. Uh, he talks about the dug fir logging. I'm sure there's going to be a chapter coming up on redwoods. So uh, he goes all around the planet. Uh, Telling stories about trees, the overstory, winner of the Pulitzer Prize. And with that, I am going to wrap up my last public 
uh, Sunday Doomsday Sermon. I will be continuing them over there on Patreon. And uh, when I will be back at Collapse Chronicles, I do not know. But uh, it has been fun being a Doomsday Preacher for the past 10 years. Come see me over on Patreon if you want to hear more of these Doomsday Sermons. Bye, guys.